but Tony was a reporter for the um, Rutland Herald, the Newsday, Newsweek, and New York Times. And then from 1971 to 81, they were in um, Washington, D.C. Um, and Tony was working on um, Department of Justice coverage, including Watergate. Um, then he was six years as managing editor and 16 years as editor um, of Newsday. Um, and it was cited by Times Magazine and many others as one of the best magazines in the country under that under Tony's um, tenure and leadership. Um, they won a Pulitzer Prize gold medal for public service reporting twice in 1970 and 74. And then 12 more Pulitzer gold medals also during his tenure. Uh, two other books that Tony has um, worked with co-authored are Beyond the Hiss Case, the FBI, Congress, and the Cold War. And so the pop, pop, how red turned blue in the Green Mountain State, to another book about the war. So Tony and Jackie are also in the Cutner building now, right? Having many years here in Vermont and also spend a lot of time, half of their time in Rhode Island where they have extensive properties and um, do lots of gardening and other community efforts around town. And if you think Tony's writing isn't impressive enough, watch it with the chainsaw. As you've been told, um, I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm going to talk about this book, which is, uh, is it's about Betty in World War II. I'm not a historian, as uh, Mary said. I spent my life uh, working for newspapers back when people still read them. Uh, so while I'm not a historian, I know a good story when I see one. And there's some very good stories here. Now there were just about 1,700 men and women from the Bennington area who served in World War II. Who, more than two dozen of them were killed. Close to 100 were wounded. More than two dozen others spent time in prisoner of war camps. And the fact is, that for most people in Bennington, the bombing of Pearl Harbor changed their lives very suddenly and in a dramatic way. For example, Larry Powers, who many of you knew, whose family ran Powers Market in West Bennington, had never been further from home uh, than a high school class trip to the New York World's Fair. But by the time the war ended, he had been in more than two dozen countries in the Central Africa, Europe, and, and the Middle East. He began the war as a cryptographer in the Belgian Congo. He, uh, fortunately for him, he had gone to to uh, to a, uh, a business school here in Bennington, and he learned how to type 60 words a minute, and so that kept up all of the, the infantry. So he got a job as a cryptographer. He ended up as a navigator uh, on a B-24 bomber, flying bombing runs from Italy into Austria. <clears throat> now, in addition to all of the dangers that he faced on the bombing runs, there was a culture shock as well. And his full, at, 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 at his first uh, job in Africa, his unit was housed not in a barracks, but in a local hotel. It was a hotel that had a totally open unisex bathroom with no private stalls. And he was taken aback the first time he used it, but a woman came in and sat down right next to him. He, he told me to see not to bother her. But I was a kid with Worth Bennington, and it sure bothered me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to imagine just how quick the changes were. Young men, many of them not even old enough to, to vote, seemed to go almost overnight from playing basketball at the YMCA gym, which used to be downtown on Main Street, and hunting for deer on Woodford Mountain, to dropping bombs up Pacific Islands, and race it across France with patent stains. 
young women who had been taking care of uh, newborn babies and steers with broken legs at Butler Hospital suddenly ended up uh, working, treating combat casualties in, in war zones. <clears throat> now, there are people from Bennington involved in almost every major uh, battle of, of, of the war. Brandon William Gordon was killed at the Battle of the Bulge. Brandon Norman Mayers, who had been a star basketball player at Bennington High School, was captured at the Battle of the Bulge. And he spent the rest of the war in a, in a German prison camp. Sergeant Anthony Apello, he, he was captured when he parachuted in, into Normandy on D-Day, and he spent the rest of the war in a prison camp. Gideon LaCroix and, and, and Robert Laporte were, were two young Marines who saw the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. Now, you know, back then, there were two Catholic parishes in Bennington. One of them mostly Irish, and the other entirely French-Canadian. Uh, people like Laporte and LaCroix, when he went to the Sacred Heart School, were taught by French Canadian nuns, and they spoke French in the classroom. Class they never spoke English in a classroom until they got to Benton High School. Sergeant Donald White of Benton was in the crew of the first American bombers that dropped bombs on Berlin itself. Private Donald Davies of Dewey Street was, was at Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. Sergeant J.C. Jerome whose family owned uh, Fillmore Farms, was a cousin of Winston Churchill, as most of you know. Churchill's mother was a Jenny Jerome from New York. And he served with the 10th Mountain uh, Division, and he won a bronze star for taking part in a bayonet charge in the, in the Apennine Mountains in, in, in Italy. Private Morris Shirkoff, uh, was caught up in the, in the famous death march on the Amatan. He spent three years in a, in a Japanese prison. And when he, he just came home, he told his parents he didn't want to eat rice again. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, the soldiers who took part in the, in the, uh, in the, the death march never called it that. It was, it was the newspapers that called it a death march. The people who took part in it just called it our hike. When they were rescued, you know, toward the near the end of the war, uh, one of the people who was killed in the rescue was, uh, was Dr. James Fisher, who was the son of Dorothy Canfield Fisher. Uh, from Arlington, and he was a captain in the army. Now, many, uh, many people from Bennington saw very serious combat. John Maloney, who many of you know was a sheriff here for many years, uh, he was at the Kasserine Pass in, in Tunisia, which was a major defeat for the Americans. Uh, all, of, all of you who saw the movie Patton know how bad that was. He later fought in Sicily. He landed in France on D-Day. His unit was the first of the American troops to cross the Rhine into Germany. And they came running right back at the Battle of the Bulge, which he said was a terrible fighting. It was the worst fighting he was in. Now, Bob Laporte, who I mentioned earlier, was a Marine. He, he was in charge of a motor squad on uh, on the Bogartville in jungle growth that was so thick that they couldn't see 10 yards ahead of them. They suddenly found the Japanese so close that they couldn't use the order tripod or the sight. And Laporte had to take the barrel off the tripod, put it in his overturned upside down helmet and fire on straight up in the air. He said, they were right in our faces. We fired and fired and fired. We killed quite a few and didn't lose a man. The Marines later said that Laporte and his crew killed 75 Japanese in that one afternoon. 
So you had a person here from Bennington, killed 75 Japanese in one day, came home, ran to the local bus station across the street, and became better known for what his family said were making mean apple pies. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill Kearns, uh, who grew up on Gage Street, he survived the bonsai attack uh, in the South Pacific, and he was wounded at Saipan. He later became a senior uh, official in, in, in the administration of, a, uh, of Governor Philip Hoff, although it never seemed to affect his work, and I knew him pretty well when, he, when, I, when I was a young reporter covering the State House, and he was there. He probably had what today would be called post-traumatic stress, having repeated nightmares about having to uh, about himself having to kill Japanese with a bayonet when his unit was being overrun. But he also showed a sense of humor in a letter that he wrote to his parents about getting a purple heart and a bronze star. There was the usual uh, event, he said, a parade, a band and a general who was handing out the awards. And then, taking note of the very popular 1941 movie called Sergeant York, in which Gary Cooper played World War I hero Alvin York, and was shown getting kissed on both cheeks by a French general who was pinning a medal on him. He added, I felt like Sergeant York, only I didn't get the French kiss. <laughs> Uh, Kearns, by the way, was with the, uh, the 6th Regiment of the 2nd Marines, which was known as, as the, the uh, Pogi Bait Marines. Everybody here know, know what Pogi Bait is? Huh? Well, a few of you don't, so I'll tell you, the rest of you. Back in the 20s and 30s, Marines in the Philippines and China were given, uh, as, as part of the rations, they were given candy bars like Tootsie Rolls and, and Baby Roots. Such uh, sweets were almost unknown in that part of the world, and it became widely popular. And uh, prostitutes in China would trade their favorites for candy bars. And since a slang, uh, a slang word for prostitutes was pokey, Candy bars became known or as Pokey Bay. And when the 6th Marine Regiment sailed for Shanghai in 1931, the ships were loaded so haphazardly that it, it included 10,000 candy bars and one bar of soap. <laughs> so they quickly became known as the Pokey Bay Marine. Now, Joseph Trotic who many of you knew, obviously, saw a great deal of fighting in the South Pacific. He, he was wounded several times. He, he was given a battlefield commission. He left here right out of high school with, with, with the Vermont National Guard. Uh, he ended up with a bronze star, a silver star, and two, two purple hearts. He later said the worst thing about fighting in, in a jungle was that you were always hot and dirty and could never take a bath in streams because the mosquitoes were, were so thick. It's hard to explain, he said, but you live like an animal. And Robert Sulsville was a prime example of how people could go very different ways in the war because of a simple luck of the draw. He and his high school friend, Victor Racio, enlisted the same day, and they trained together as, as aviation mechanics. They switched to the pilot training on the same day, and they got their wings the same day. But Salsville was, was then sent to the war in the Pacific, and Racio was sent south to Louisiana. Salsville, uh, who was married to Geraldine Mara, whose father ran Mara Shoe Store down uh, on North Street. He piloted uh, a B-24 Liberation Bomber that had both her name, Geraldine, and a set of shark's teeth 
painted on the nose. He flew 58 Bobby missions, and risked being shot down 58 times. Graziel spent the entire war flying airmen training to become navigators on night flights so they could practice night navigation skills. He dropped no bombs anywhere that was never shot at. Now, for a long time, many people who had been in the war wouldn't talk about it. My own father, who was in the Army for more than four years, most of it in the, in the South Pacific, only told us one war story ever. He said, I dug the deepest foxhole on Okinawa. <laughs> that began changing in 1998, when Tom Brokaw did a book about the war called The Greatest Generation. And that caused many veterans, most of them already, already in their 80s by then, to begin talking about their experiences. And two years later, the Bennington Historical Society began doing oral histories of Bennington men and women who served. There are only about two dozen of these, and they're so good, I wish they'd done a hundred. Uh, but uh, I use them so extensively in this book that all the proceeds from this book are going to be donated to the historical society. I found the interview with James Merrill to be especially engaging. He and his brother Joseph were identical twins who seemed to have been very, very quiet young men. Their high school yearbook shows that all the while they were at Benjamin High School, they played no sports, they joined no clubs, they took part in no extracurricular activities at all, but they landed at D-Day they went across France with Pakistanis, they fought in the Battle of the Bulge, and they each came home with five battle stars. Since neither of them knew anything about internal combustion engines, the Army, as it tended to do, decided to make mechanics of them. They trained for months to learn how to repair motorcycles, and then there was, they, they were transferred to a unit that had no motorcycles at all, but heavy trucks. So they started all over again, learning how to repair trucks. The long story short is that they ended up with a company of tank retrievers. Those were trucks that had 14 wheels. They were the largest that the Army had that were used to retrieve broken down or damaged tanks and haul them back to repair or stripped down for replacement parts. Murrow said that there were some horrible aspects to retrieving a tank. If a tank was hit with an incendiary shell, the screams were just terrible, he said. Sometimes you could see through the tanks because they were so hot and the ammunition were in racks were hit. And at other times, uh, the tanks were hit with a high velocity shell that went right through them. What happened then was that uh, everyone in the crew died of a concussion uh, when all the air was displaced by the shell going through. There was not a scratch on them, except maybe a little bit of blood around the nose. Their eyes were wide open, and they were all dead. Uh, he recounted that on, on the D-Day, he and his brother landed at Utah Beach. We were lucky, he said, because we landed at the wrong place, and we didn't have anywhere near as many casualties as they did on Omaha Beach. He also recovered coming to shore on a landing craft. There was a landing craft right next to us that got hit. One minute it was there, the next minute there was nothing at all, just pieces of flesh that fell down all over us. A few weeks later, their unit was transferred from the First Army to the Third Army, which was commanded by Patton. What a change, he said. Boy, oh boy, it was extreme. You could never sit down to eat. You could never sleep. You slept where you could and where you could, under trucks, in the mud, anywhere. <clears throat> but you had to be ready to move constantly, which we did. There was no day or night, sort of. It was always moving forward. General Patton used to come up to the tour of the repair area. If there was a tank that wasn't moving, you wanted to know why someone's head was going to roll. Now, one of the, the good things that came out of the war. There were actually two very broad good things that came out of the war. One was that for the first time, many women 
moved into jobs that previously had been uh, held almost entirely by men. That was especially true in, in all the mills here. The second was the GI Bill, which allowed millions of people to go to college who never would have in the past. Now, Miro uh, seems to have collected every dime of GI Bill money that he was entitled to. He first was accepted at the University of Oklahoma, and he enrolled there. His first week on, on campus, his counselor asked him what the hell he was doing out in Oklahoma when there's such a good college in his hometown. Well, that's for girls, Merrill told him. No, he was told. Bennington had always had a few men, mainly because they needed them for, for drama and dance. And he could save himself a lot of money, he was told, and travel time if he enrolled there instead, so Merrill did. There were two other men in his class. One of them was Alan Arkin, who all you know became a movie star. Miro first got a degree from Bennington, then a master's degree from North Adams State College, then he went to France if we get any studied paint, study painting at the University of Paris. Most of the people I've written about in this book are going to get a dead mouth and in some respects, I'm sorry, I didn't do it 20 years ago. But Bob Salsko, who I mentioned before, is 100 years old, and he's living out at the, at the Brookdale Center. Margaret Lilly, who most of you know, who served as a Navy wave and went to school on the GI Bill, is 98, and she's at the Veterans Home now. And Gideon LaCroix, who may be the last person still alive who saw the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima, is 98 and living in Arlington. LaCroix took part in fighting on Guadalcanal, Guam, Bougainville, and Iwo Jima, and he was asked by his commanding officer to stay with the unit and become part of the Army of Occupation in Japan. No thanks, could you told me. There's only one place I want to go, and that's home. Thank you.